Welcome to Small Pleasures, a podcast that discusses great short stories and greatness in the short story form. My name is Livy Michael and I'm a novelist and short story writer from Manchester, England. And this is Sonia Moore, short story writer and translator from Paris, France. Bienvenue. We've come together because of a mutual enthusiasm for the short story, although I think our responses and what we want from a short story vary, and we hope that the differences will provide a fruitful discussion. For this episode, we're delighted to welcome a very special guest, Ruby Cowling, who's going to discuss her approach to short fiction. In particular, we'll be chatting about Ruby Cowling's story, Emeralds Live, which is published in volume four of the literary magazine Lunate. Ruby Cowling was born in Bradford and now lives in London. Her debut collection, This Paradise, published by Boiler House Press, was shortlisted for the 2020 Edgehill Prize and longlisted for the 2020 Orwell Prize for political fiction. Her stories have won the White Review Prize and London Short Story Prize, among others, and have been widely published in journals and anthologies, including Lighthouse, The Letters Page, Anthology and The Lonely Crowd. Ruby is currently teaching a short story course with Arvon along with Yangi. Welcome, Ruby. I think Livy has our first question for you about your story, Emerald's Life. Yes, I thought I could ask you to start by telling us a little about this story and how you came to write it, Ruby. Hi, uh, bonjour, and thanks very much for having me on this brilliant podcast. It's really an honour. I just love it so much. Yeah, this story, Emerald's Life, started out many versions ago as the opening to a novel, but it is very much a short story, and I think it's always wanted to be one. I've been playing for quite a lot of years with a what-if about social media and points schemes, you know, loyalty schemes like Tesco Club Card or one of those. I'm wanting to explore what social effects there might be if a social network started to directly reward users with something that could be used as cash. And I was remembering as well when we used to regularly get riots or fights anyway at the opening of a new Ikea or at the Boxing Day sales, if you remember, kind of pre-internet shopping days, and how normal people will actually fight each other for the chance to save money or make money, especially when times are really tough, like after the 2008 crash and the early days of austerity. Yes, it really demonstrates how rapidly we lose the veneer of civilization. Your short stories, especially in the collection This Paradise, are eclectic and diverse in style and theme. But what strikes me about them is that they're all rooted in what I would describe as the real world, politics, science, economics, ecology, often just a short parallel step away from this world, as in Emerald's Live. In this sense, they might be described as social realism, yet they're more inventive and experimental than that sounds. Do you think of yourself as a political writer and what kind of things inspire you to write? I didn't really think of myself as a political writer until other people started mentioning it, but I definitely don't deny it because I feel it gives me a kind of gravitas. For me, I'm just endlessly wrestling with the world out there. I mean, aren't we all? And I'm fascinated by the systems that we use to organise ourselves out of the mud and chaos that we'd otherwise be in and all of the effects of the flaws and the traps of those systems. And I'm really interested in the way that governments and large companies are made up of individual people, and yet they come to develop this emergent property that turns them into something else, into kind of beings with more nebulous intentions, maybe. And then those beings act on individuals in ways that aren't necessarily a lot of fun for the individual. This feels like a concern of a lot of sci-fi writers to me. So I'm not sure whether I'm on the edges of sci-fi or political writing or something in between, or maybe both. Well, I came to Emerald's Live just after rereading Flamingo Land, and it seems to me there are certain parallels in that I see both stories as a dystopian take on our social reality, but they really are very close to it. In Emerald's Live, we have the banking crisis, the power of social media, recession, outrageously high fuel prices. To quote from your story, people talk so much crap about the real world versus online as if there was an actual border somewhere. It would be easy to paraphrase this and say that the border between your fictions and the kind of social reality we live in is almost invisible. And in fact, you do set this story in a specific time, 2010, and place. And while you play with the naming, so we have the See Me platform, Airbury, and the brilliantly conceived Mum and Dad, The other names from this story, Kelly, Sophie, Martin, are directly from this contemporary world. So I think what I mean to say is you challenge the borders between genres, 
I worried a little that my reading of Emerald's Live as a dystopian fiction was affected by my reading of Flamingo Land, and that actually it was a straightforwardly realistic narrative, because it is so close to our world. Would you like to comment on that play with genre? Yeah, well, I think you caught me a bit there. I did wonder, as I was writing Emerald's Life, whether I was just rewriting Flamingo Land. But maybe all writers are doomed to keep revisiting the same concerns and just shining slightly different coloured lights on them. Let's hope that's true. I think the genre is probably alternative history for this story. Yes, actually, that's a great description. Because it, it does have that specific setting of 2010. But the existence of CME as a big social network and the introduction of its loyalty scheme currency are obviously an invention. I had to think about whether a scheme like Emeralds would have been possible at that time, technologically and socially, and to think back to a time, although it's only 14 years ago, when we didn't really have the word influencers. I mean, people were blogging and just about vlogging, but for example, Instagram didn't exist, although it was just about to appear. And as I mentioned in the story, the iPhone 4 is about to come out that year. And I think that was the first widely available front facing camera, which massively boosted selfie taking. So in 2010, we were kind of ripe for the explosion in self exposure. And we were also post global financial meltdown. So people were struggling after the relatively comfortable 2000s. By contrast with Flamingo Land, I didn't give a year. It was just meant to be now ish, which did take a lot less research but they'd both fall within the general genre of speculative fiction. And I would imagine most speculative fiction exists because it wants to do some kind of social commentary, whether overtly or not. The work of Life is set in 2010. It seemed to me to present a close future, but it also felt very recognisable as now. As I was reading Emerald's Life, The Machine Stops came to me, that story by E.M. Forster. Forster's story dates from the early... 1900s, but describes a world much like ours in terms of connection and non-connection through technology. He seems to have imagined the internet long before it existed. And thinking about Forster's story, I started wondering if you had an idea of who you were writing for, a contemporary reader or a reader from, say, a century from now. And what place did you record the reader in crafting your story? That is a really interesting thought. I've never considered writing for future readers in fact, I might worry that some of the specific detail would be really alienating for them. Like, what on earth was a slank it? Mm. And would they remember that we were so angry about the bankers not going to prison after 2008? Anyway, no, I definitely write for contemporary readers. I suppose my hope is that they'll say, oh yeah, that scenario, while entertaining, is also quite worrying. And it's only a tiny step sideways from where we are. And then someone maybe more activist than me might take some action to mitigate things. So I am doing it for quite selfish purposes. Maybe another way of putting it is that when I ask, can you smell burning? I want someone else to say, oh yes, I can. What is that? And then we have that moment of recognition that there's trouble and it might need investigating. That's a brilliant way of of expressing this possible purpose of writing. Can you smell burning? Yes, excellent. You create a bleak world with an absolutely compelling narrative and a humour which offsets the bleakness. But most of your stories also suggest the human capacity for bonding, as in the ground is considerably distorted. And in this one, Kelly's feelings about her brother. Would you say you avoid writing something totally dystopian? Do you always include an element of hope? Well, I try to include an element of humanity or humaneness, because otherwise it's really off-putting, both for me and for a reader. Kelly, the main character in Emerald's Life, is a fairly awful person in this story, but her innate compassion is there, making her feel at least a moment of guilt about what she does. It's just got mangled and buried because of her family history that's left her full of rage and grief. I would feel uncomfortable about presenting that awfulness that she has without the mitigating history, though I expect a braver writer than me could probably do that to good effect but yeah I don't want to do bleak only there's enough of that in the world and I do want to gesture to the fact that ultimately we are all in this madness together both your story, Emma's Live, and the M. Forster story, The Machine Stops, end with the protagonist walking out alone. In Forster's story, the protagonist resists the system and seeks redemption, even at great cost. And your protagonist, Kelly, seemed less ready to pay the price of her redemption. So the end note seemed more pessimistic, perhaps. Can you talk about crafting your ending? How did you find that end note? That is such a brilliant story. And I wouldn't be surprised if the ending of The Machine Stops has been an unconscious influence. 
At the end of Emerald's life, Kelly's extremely uncomfortable because she's just questioning for the first time what she might be giving away by embracing the system. She's got that potential redemption, which is just rising in her subconscious, but it feels really terrible. She feels so bad that she doesn't want to speak to anyone or even for anyone to see her, which is incredibly unusual for her. She's been thriving on attention from 12,000 followers up to now. It feels so bad and confusing that she can't accept it. So yeah, she's not going to be redeemed, not by resisting the system anyway, because frankly, she needs the money and she's already addicted to the attention. At the end of that story, the automatic doors do see her opening to let her out into the dark. So what's the point in trying to hide away? I think she thinks. I'd agree that it's a pessimistic ending from my point of view, but also I have in mind that she goes on to be a famous influencer. And in a sense, she is happy in that future. But obviously, there's always a question mark over the price she'll pay for that choice. One of the many aspects of this story that I found admirable is how you fine-tuned to both keep readers engaged and deliver a character who is probably not likeable to most people. Vulnerability seemed to be working hard for balance with the character, and comedy seemed to be working hard for reader engagement. I'd love to know more about both these aspects. Yes, yeah, she is quite horrible, and it was fun to write. In most of the very many earlier versions, that character was really nice, but that made her passive and also meant there weren't many places the story could go. I've been thinking more and more about the short story being a fundamentally transgressive form, or at least a form that creates a space to present transgression in an intense and energetic, but also swallowable way. I've said before that with the short form, you can kind of ring the doorbell and run away. Or if you're really good at it, you can set the house on fire and run away. With Longer forms, though, you've got to be prepared to stick around for the repercussions of everything that happens, which for me, it's a tedious amount of responsibility. So if you're writing a horrible character, it can be hard to sit with that in a long form. But if you can keep them in a smallish container, you can really go to town, if that makes sense. It's still uncomfortable, though. So humour is one way that I try to alleviate that both for myself and the reader. And I suppose making her vulnerable is another way of deepening her making it up to the reader for making them spend time with this awful person. There's a reveal on a difficult moment in the protagonist's past. And I like that this went some way to explain the protagonist, Kelly, but it didn't justify why she behaves the way she does. It leaves the ethics of her actions questionable. There's space for freedom of choice and questions of right and wrong that go beyond cause and effect. We get to see character in the moral sense. Were you thinking about ethics when you crafted your story? And if so, were you thinking in societal terms or more in terms of that particular character's arc? Yeah, I'm always thinking about ethics, but definitely in societal terms and really setting Kelly against normal expectations of right and wrong. I wanted her to transgress and see where that took her in terms of whether she'd try to make amends or whether she'd even feel bad about it, especially as the situation makes her suddenly face a lot of emotional turbulence. But the societal ethics of the whole scenario are obviously what drives the story, so there's already a sort of hazy ethical background, and I'm seeing that as one of the ways she justifies the way she acts. In the same way uh, that a corrupt government makes its citizens feel that they've got permission to act corruptly themselves. There's an unconscious background of no one seems to be stopping this bad situation and saying enough, so I can do what I want as well. Yeah, one of the key differences between this story and Flamingoland is the narrator. The fact that Kelly is much less sympathetic than Tom means that from what you're saying, it influences the shape of the story as well as the voice, which is interesting. Absolutely. In terms of voice, Emerald's life is seemingly narrated by a young female, but there's perhaps a shadow of authorial presence or an author narrator voice. The voice shifts to something more distant and reflective sometimes, like blown in on a baleful Russian wind. Actually, this is one way that I wanted to deepen that character. She is clever and she's got a little bit of poetry in her soul somewhere. So although she uses a lot of slang and swearing, and has a mainly casual way of narrating, she sometimes does describe things a little bit more elegantly. She probably reads books, but it's not something she talks about. (laughs) Obviously, baleful comes from the author originally, like everything does, but I excuse it by saying that she revels in finding a slightly more baroque way of describing how terrible things are, like her creativity in being cruel to her boyfriend. That's fascinating. I hadn't thought in terms of depth of character, more in terms of uh, polyphony and multiple voices. So it's great to have this angle. 
In terms of comedy, there are some cracking lines in Emerald's Eye. I love the line about the fart, which felt daring and perfectly timed. Do you have any darlings? Did you murder any? I was thinking also about how Amy Hempel found stand-up comedians helpful in learning the art of crafting a short story. And a poet once said to me that all poets were failed stand-up comedians. Zadie Smith has also written about lessons to be found in stand-up. But do you find craft lessons in stand-up? glad uh, surprised but glad that you like that line as it's very nearly been cut several times due to just generally being disgusting I definitely did murder some darlings that were in early versions um, there were mostly bits of description that were just slowing things down the images that I found for mum and dad's code of silence and their relationship with the truth about Kelly's brother which come late on in the story were really hard fought and I am pleased with those it's really interesting that you bring up stand-up comedy I'd never thought of it quite that way, but of course, good stand-up is concise and incisive storytelling. And I always maintain comedians are some of the cleverest humans around. So there's definitely craft to be learnt there. And now I'm going to go away and study them more closely. Well, on a similar theme, I heard a concert pianist say recently on radio that each performance had to be perfection. There was no room for failure. I think the same can be said for stand-up comedy and possibly also the short story. Do you think there's a performative element to the short story? And is it perhaps a less forgiving form than the novel so that you're always aiming at perfection? What does failure mean to you in terms of the short story? Well, those are some huge questions. (laughs) Yeah, for me, there is definitely a performative element to the short story. I think it sits kind of between the poem and the novel in that way, with poetry being the outright demanding look at me form. I certainly try to write nowadays with reading aloud or performance in mind. And there's certainly no better way to find failures in your sentences and paragraphs than by reading them out loud. And I mean, long after they're published, you really feel the clumsy transitions and the sagging bits. On the other hand, when you've crafted the right sentence, I suppose the closest thing to perfection that we can get, it can feel great in the mouth, as it were. That's about all the perfection we can hope for, I reckon. I don't think there's such a thing as the perfect short story in any objective sense. I just don't think there can be. But there's certainly more room for flaws in a novel. As for what failure means, well, for me, there'd be two forms of failure. One is when I try an idea and maybe work up a character in a scenario and it just doesn't come to life and I abandon it. That's just, practically speaking, a failed story. But in a more literary sense, say I might try a specific technique and ultimately not really pull it off in my own opinion, even if I finish the story and it has basic functionality. For example, I wrote a piece called Speed of Life for a brilliant Confingo anthology of stories, all inspired by Songs on Low, the David Bowie album to mark its 45th anniversary. For listeners, the book's called Waiting for the Gift, and it's out now. In the writing, I set rules for myself around the timing of the punctuation, which was dictated by the number of beats and bars in the song itself, for the level of action or internality of the paragraphs. They were dictated by the verse, chorus, and bridge sections, even though it was a song with no lyrics, so there weren't really verses and a chorus, but you get the idea. It was a set of restrictions that I put in place as an experiment, and it was a fun and interesting challenge, But ultimately, those rules had repercussions for the normal rhythms of the sentences and the normal shape of the story, neither of which came out the way I would normally try and get them to. So to me, it was a bit of a failure, but a kind of non-neurotic failure, a happy failure. So interesting, since we both love Speed of Life and would urge everyone to read it in that collection, Waiting for the Gift. Absolutely. Ditto, Livy. I love that story. It really stood out for me in that anthology. I mean, Sonia initially proposed that one for discussion. So it's interesting that the writer's perception and the reader's can be so different. Can I ask what you're working on at the moment? Are you aiming towards another collection? I am. It's a collection of strongly linked stories. Each story is kind of longer in length, as I seem to be writing quite long short stories at the moment. Some of them are set in the fictional airbury like Emerald's Life. If you force me to describe what it's about, I'd say something like the boundaries of our inner and outer selves, the effects of technological change on our bodies, our emotions and our relationship with the earth. So basically everything. Exciting. I love the idea of setting the stories in the same fictional world. Well, sadly, we're running out of time, but you've been listening to Ruby Cowling, short story writer extraordinaire. Do look up her collection, This Paradise from Boiler House Press. It was one of my favourite reads last year. And the terrific short story, Emeralds Live, published by Lunate, issue four. 
Ruby, thank you so much for joining us in this episode. Thanks again for having me. It's been a real treat to have your questions, such in-depth, great questions, and to spend some more time with short story lovers. Oh, wonderful <laughs> insights there. And do look out for future collections. Meanwhile, once again, thank you for listening to this Small Pleasures podcast and do keep your eyes and ears open for our next. Watch this space. We have many great short stories to cover. Until then, goodbye from me and Sonia. Hello.